This is the Sunday, December 17, 2023 edition of Wilderness Wanderings. This podcast includes a reading of Revelation 5 and John 20, 21 and 23, and the message from our worship service at Emmanuel. The entire service is on our YouTube channel, which on YouTube is ICRC Hamilton. You can also find the link on our website, emmanuelministries.ca. May God bless you as you participate. Please join me in prayer for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible and the treasures we may find in it. We pray that together with their teachers, the children in Rocks and Roots may learn more about you and grow to love you more deeply. As we now prepare to open the Bible and hear it explained to us, we ask for your Spirit's blessing on the reading and proclamation of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. And then to John 20, verse 21 to 23. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You, I think, I assume, uh, I've been listening to some Christmas music. And uh, this thing called Spotify, kind of helpful. It plays all kinds of Christmas songs. You got that? All right, good, Chris. I'm glad you're with me. Yeah, yeah. So we listen to all this Christmas music through the ages. It keeps coming, song after song. And and I've been noticing some themes in all of these songs. And so I thought, I I wonder wonder if that's true, if there are some themes. And so I did the other uh, thing that we do these days when we're looking for some information. We go to Google. And I simply typed in top Christmas songs. Simple, straightforward. You ask a different question, you get a different answer, of course. But here are the top Christmas songs according to that search from Google. All I want for Christmas is you. Anybody heard of that? Okay, some of you have 
All I want for Christmas is you. Then there was one I had never heard of before. It's called Fairy Tale in New York, or Fairy Tale of New York. Anybody know that? No. No. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brent. Thank you. I'm glad there's somebody here who, who, who knows that song. It's, it's a song that, um, about sour dreams, about some older folks who are just sort of like feeling life is kind of messed up. It isn't quite what it was meant to be. Then there is uh, Last Christmas I Gave You My Heart. None of you have heard that one, right? Yeah, I You've heard of that one. <clears throat> or White Christmas by Bing Cosby. Everybody else has uh, sung that one as well. And then Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. Now, as I was thinking about all these songs and, and, and what they're about, it strikes me that, well, a lot of them are love songs. A lot of them are about unrequited love, love that's simply a disappointment that hasn't become what it was meant to be or expected to be. Uh, you know, White Christmas might be about happy people, but most of them are really about unhappy people that are feeling a little bit miffed, disappointed with the world, longing for something more, something meaningful. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about all of you sitting here, and, and not just here, but all of you watching us participating online, and I wondered if, if all of us are, well, if we're not like that too a little bit. When we talk about Christmas, what do we talk about? Well, we talk about family gatherings. We talk about Christmas parties with our office or our group of friends. And we talk about the stresses of those gatherings of family members who don't want to come or office people who simply refuse to participate in such frivolity. We, we talk about all the special foods that we're preparing and the dinners that we're going to have. We decorate our homes and we buy presents for people who simply don't need them. We create wish lists so that others will buy us presents that we don't need. And if we eat a little bit too much and we drink a little bit too much and we take home at least one or two good presents and, and everybody kind of gets along, then, then we're happy about our Christmas. Then when somebody on January 3 says, how was your Christmas? We say, yeah, it was good. And yet, as soon as we say that, as soon as it exits our mouth, we go, ah, but that seems so trivial. Surely there is more to it than just that. As we dismantle the tree and we pack up the decorations and, and we find that spot for that gift that we really don't like, but we feel obligated to keep it out in the open nonetheless. Now, it's not that there's anything wrong with all of these things of family gatherings and office parties and, and having good dinners together and exchanging gifts. I'm not suggesting that that's wrong. But, but you're right when you say on January 3, there's got to be something more. It's just not enough to make it all worthwhile. There's got to be more. So what does it really mean to have a good Christmas? Now, I suppose that there are all kinds of ways that we could answer that question. But here in the context of this congregation of this particular December of 2023, we are offering this. That what makes Christmas real and what makes it good is the incarnation of the Son of God. The Word made flesh the fullness of God in living form. In other words, Jesus. Ah, but you say, but why? How does that impact us? What, what does that mean? Incarnation, it's such a large word. And I'm telling you, if you get out your theology textbook, you look up the word incarnation, it's probably not going to help you very much because both Pastor Anthony and I did that. We'll go, huh? So hopefully we're offering a little bit more to you then, huh? 
And, and so we've been talking about some, well, some offices. Last week, I talked about the prophetic office. The prophet is a person who speaks the word of God, the spoken word of God in the flesh. And we talked about the disciples with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah showed up. And what did God say to the, those disciples? He said, this is my son whom I have chosen, whom I love. Listen to him. And I asked the question, well, why did God chose that moment to say to the disciples, listen to my son? And the answer was that because Jesus was telling them that they, he had to suffer and to die. And the disciples were going, not over our dead bodies, you're not. God said yes, and Jesus said yes. And then Jesus says, and you have to follow me in the way of suffering. And I wondered with you if maybe one of the reasons that the church has so little to say to the world is because we are unwilling to suffer for the sake of the gospel. That we have really gotten caught up in all the coziness and, and, and worldly celebrations, if I can put it that way, of Christmas and maybe we have forgotten a little bit about what Christmas is really about. And our lack of suffering has kept us quiet. This morning, then, I want to turn a corner to talk about a second office, the priestly office. And in order to understand that office and to talk about it, we got to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to those early chapters where the world is created and a garden is made by God, and God puts in the garden his people, his humanity. And he forms a covenant relationship with them. And, and the story of Genesis is that God and his people, they would walk together in the garden in the cool of the evening, and they would just talk. They would have fellowship together. They would have meaningful conversations. They felt safe, if I am able to put it that way. They felt safe with one another. And there was only one guideline, there was only rule, one rule in the garden, and that was the people were not to eat from the tree that God had planted in the middle of the garden. the Garden of Eden. And so this is the opening story of the scriptures, and, and the scripture doesn't tell us how long this good fellowship went on. And I think we can imagine that it took some time. It was there, and it was good. But then at one point, God's people saw the tree and the fruit, and they chose to disobey and to eat. And so death entered the garden. And the writer of Genesis puts it this way. So the Lord God drove... I suppose there, that's, that's better. You can read along with me. So the Lord God drove the man, that is humanity... Adam and Eve together out of the Garden of Eden. He sent the man to farm the ground he had, made, he had been made from. The Lord God drove him out and then placed angels on the east side of the garden. He also placed there a flaming sword that flashed back and forth. The angels and the sword guarded the way to the tree of life. This is a story that sets the stage for the entire scriptures. This fellowship between God and his people in the garden was broken, and God drove his people out of the garden, and he put in front of the garden this flaming sword moving back and forth in the angels so that his people could not get back into the garden. Now, I know that this sounds fantastical, like fantasy literature, and some of you are not into that, but as C.S. Lewis said in J.R. Tolkien, Christians ought to read some fantasy because it sparks the imagination. And we're not supposed to like detail this like an engineer or like some kind of a grammar textbook, but our minds are to be filled with his image 
of this garden. And now there's this sword in front of it going back and forth and these angels guarding the way. And Adam and Eve outside in the wilderness in the dust trying to act out a living from the ground and desperately desiring to get back into that garden the goodness and the fellowship that was there, but unable to go because their way is blocked. And if we are to understand Christmas, if we are to to understand the priestly office and be able to say on January 3rd, it was a good Christmas, we need to understand this, that this is our story that we are part of it, that we are part of the trouble that was caused by Adam and Eve when they took the fruit and they disobeyed. Now, that doesn't mean that we are terrible people, the worst kind of people on earth. But what it means is that the corruption is part of our lives, that we ourselves live in a world that is broken and marred, Where the rich have too much and the poor have too little. Where the ground is broken and no longer produces enough food because we have raped it and leached it of its goodness. Where the systems of government no longer provide good and well-being for their citizens, but a lot of bad, a lot of trouble. Where we are infected by illness, and broken relationships. And a lot of this stuff is just there. But also that we ourselves contribute to it. And we too are people who lie and steal, who insult and belittle, who like to use our power to diminish others. And lift ourselves up. That the fellowship is broken. We too are banished from the garden. If we don't believe this, that we are part of this story, then my dear friends, the whole Christmas thing doesn't make any sense at all. Then it really is all this fluffy stuff that the songs talk about. Unless we understand that we are banished from the garden, that God drives us out because we have failed him, unless we too see ourselves as part of the story, Christmas doesn't make sense. That we are disconnected from life, from the source of life that is our God. And so, In whatever way you can picture it in your imagination, I want you to picture this. I want you to picture that garden with God inside and this flaming sword in front of it with these angels going back and forth. And any time you get too close, you get singed, you get burned, you get driven back because you are not allowed in the garden. But the thing that you want most, the thing that is most precious in your life is that garden. It's to be brought back into fellowship with God, to be able to see God's face again, and to feel that safety of being in his presence. Because that's the story of the scriptures. And so in the Old Testament, when Israel is created, one of the things that God does is to create the priesthood. And these priests... They take the offerings that the people bring, the, the lambs and the, and the rams and the cows and the goats, and sacrifice them on the altar, and it's a bloody mess. It all sounds so nice and clean and, and clinical in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, but it's a bloody mess. It is blood from morning till night. The place has got to stink. I think that's why the incense was there all the time, to keep the smell at bay. But we got dead animals, and we got blood running all over the place. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you can still find the gutters where the blood ran out of the temple, through the city, outside the city, into the dump, because there was a lot of blood. And these priests, they sacrifice these offerings, these animals, day after day, year after year, in order to bring forgiveness to the people, in order for the people to have some fellowship with God, But it was never enough. The next day, they had to start all over again. 
And there was never that sense of well-being, that safety, that they could get into the garden and they could stay there. They could see God's face and God would say, it's okay. And so throughout the Old Testament, that story, this endless flowing of blood moves from day to day, year to year, century to century, generation to generation. And that's why we end up with the scroll, another great fantasy picture in the book of Revelation. The scroll represents the plan, God's plan for history. And this scroll is sealed up, which means that the plan cannot be completed. And so somebody needs to be there who's capable, who's strong enough to both open the seal and also to execute the plan. And nobody can be found. And so John begins to weep because he knows that this picture of the flaming sword and the angels in the front of the garden are there to stay. If nobody can be found to open the scroll and to execute the plan of God, the whole world is in trouble. And so he weeps. And then one of the elders taps him on the shoulders and says, don't weep because one has been found. He is the Lion of Judah. The root of David, he has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And so I want you, you you all know what a lion is, right? I don't have to show you a picture, you know what a lion is? I want you to picture the most magnificent lion that you can imagine. One who is strong and powerful and roars with the depth of his voice. Shakes the trees and the mountains. This is... This is what John hears. The lion of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. And he's imagining some beast of the field that nobody can conquer. And he turns around, and what does he see? He sees a lamb. But not just any lamb. A lamb that has been slain, that has been brought to the slaughter. This is the one. This lamb, this is the one who can open this scroll, open its seals, and execute God's plan for history. This lamb offered himself on the altar to be killed. He endured the pain. He went willingly bearing all the humiliation that the world could heap on him. He took everything that Satan could hurl at him. The priest offered himself. Now someday what I want you to do is is I want you to read chapter 5 of Revelation and then read the entire book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is kind of complicated and difficult. But the book of Hebrews, it seems to me, is simply a commentary on this vision. It is a, is a commentary that says, this lamb is our priest. He is our high priest. He has opened the way. He has offered himself. And the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand something about this lamb. This is not simply some magnificent lion that lives out in the world and, and doesn't understand us. Or, or this is not... This is not some godlike figure who lives up in heaven and doesn't know what life is like on earth. No, the point of Hebrews is that this lamb, this word of God, this God-made flesh dwelt among us. And he understands and can empathize and sympathize with us. He understands the pain and the trial. He grew up like one of us from his mother's womb all the way into adulthood. He understands the pain, the struggles of life. He understands the temptations that we face to go against God and to go our own way. He gets it because he's experienced it all, says the writer of Hebrews. But he endured it all, and then he offered himself on the altar of the cross in order to open the way through the curtain or to use the imagery of Genesis to move aside the sword and the angels and to open a hole in the wall and to say, come in to the presence of God. 
And all those who will follow the Lamb may come into the presence of God. And the way is no longer dangerous. We don't have to find our way past the flaming sword and the angels. All we have to do is follow the trail of blood that is the blood of the Lamb and enter into the presence of God. He is worthy to open the scroll and to reveal its seals. Now, why? Why would he do that? The scriptures tells us in that well-known verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, anyone who believes in him will not die but have eternal life. Jesus did all of that because he loves us. God's word to Israel already was, I chose you not because of something that you've done or are, but because I love you. The word of God is that he loves us so much, he was willing to enter death's domain for us. And having brought us into the presence of God, having forgiven us all our sins, made us right with God, brought us back into fellowship with him, he then sends us out into the world. As we read from the scriptures, peace be with you. The Father has sent me, now I am sending you. If we are to be able to say it's a good Christmas, then we need to understand that Jesus is our priest, that he has opened the way, brought us back into fellowship with God. And as the Father sent him to do that, he now sends us out into the world to be his priests. When we started this series, we talked about identity and about vocation, who we understand ourselves to be and what we do. One of our senses of identity is that we are priests of God, that we serve him. When you ask the question, when you are asked the question, who are you? I I don't advise you to tell people this because it'd be weird. But in your own mind, you are allowed to say, I am a priest of God. He breathed on them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you love anyone's sins, their sins will be forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So what does this look like, being a priest in the world? Well, let me suggest a few things. First is where we just came from, love. If God loves us this much, then we are called to go out and to love the world. So when you meet people, Right? Whether they're standing at the stoplight in Upper James and Mohawk looking for some money, whether they are your cash, working the cash register in a local grocery store, or they are some anonymous people behind some website. What is your, what is your reaction? What is our reaction to them? Often they're just people somebody else. But if we are to be priests of God, then one of the things we need to do is say, Lord, help me to love these people. Help me to see them not simply as people, but as people you have called me to love. Second thing is grace. If you forgive their sins, they will be forgiven. As I said before, grace is one of the great topics of the Christian faith. And yet it is so, so difficult to understand. And maybe it's not so much it's difficult to understand as much as it's difficult to practice. To truly forgive someone who has offended and hurt you. It's tough stuff. And yet that is what we are called to do. To look someone in the eye and to say, I forgive you. Now, of course, some people don't want to be looked in the eye. And so we got to work that out without looking them in the eye. 
But one of the ways of, of practicing forgiveness is to pray for people's well-being. Because when somebody hurts you, what do you want for them? You want somebody to give them back to them, right? That they hurt as much as you hurt. That's our natural human reaction. But in prayer, we turn that around. We say, God, do good to them. And as we pray that over and over again, it becomes part of our desire. And we too want good for them. Invitation. We invite people to Jesus. Now, this is about evangelism, all right? Now, now hear what I'm saying. In evangelism, we often think about theological arguments, and we talk about coercing people, talking them into somehow believing to God, in, in, in God. And that, that's sort of been the methodology of the church in North America for a long time. We got to, like, grab people that scuff in their neck and bring them into the kingdom. I don't know that that's really a very biblical image that is there. Jesus says to disciples, you are my witnesses. In other words, you're telling stories about me. You're trying to convert, co coerce people into the kingdom. We're inviting them to meet Jesus, trusting that between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, a lot of good things are going to happen. Evangelism doesn't begin with our speaking as much as our trust in God. Invitation, prayer. We pray... We're going to do that in a few minutes. Pastor Anthony is going to lead us in prayer. And a lot of times we, we don't really get this prayer thing. A prayer is part of our priestly activity a praying for the world, bringing the world to God and saying, God, would you bless and heal this world? We pray, Lord Jesus, come and come quickly because we, we see all that's wrong with the world and we want it set right. We want good things to happen to people, not bad. I want you to notice something about Revelation 5. That we are priests to serve our God. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. Now look at these four things again. Love, grace, invitation, prayer. When we're looking at these things, I think that there's probably a little bit of nervousness because we think these things are about us. That, that somehow, you know, you know that, that these things are about us. Revelation says that we are to, these things are not about us. They are in service to God. When we forgive someone their wrongs against us, that sure, it, it has to do with our relationship with them, but it's primarily an act of service to God of bringing his kingdom, his grace into this world. It, it is primarily an act of desiring the healing that Jesus came to bring to happen in the lives of those that we know. We are servants, not first of all of ourselves, not even of the church, but servants of God. And how do we, how do we keep that? How do we keep that focus? Well, Revelation 5 tells us What's happening in Revelation 5? God's people are worshiping. Notice in Revelation 5, in Genesis 3, what happens? God drives the people out of the garden. He puts these flaming swords and, air, and angels in the way, and they can't get back. But in Revelation 5, we have this image of this countless mob, this great crowd from all nations, Gathered where? Around the throne. They are in the presence of God. And they are worshiping the one who is on the throne and the Lamb. And when we worship, 
we become secondary. We take ourselves off the throne, and we lift up God, we lift up Jesus Christ, and we declare that God, our God, is Lord. When we worship the risen Lamb, the ascended Lamb, we remember that Christmas is about the healing of the nations, and the Lamb has been sacrificed, and the healing is coming. That we are bringers of that healing But when we worship, we are worshiping in anticipation of the day when the Lamb will return and make all things new. When we worship, you know, I know I never quit, but you know, when we worship, we've so often made it about us. This is the music I like, this is the music I like, this preacher, I like that preacher. But you know, we have all these things that we like and don't like. And in all of that babble, We are forgetting what worship is. That worship is bringing ourselves into the presence of God and declaring that he is Lord, that he is king, that he holds the nations in his hand, and that someday Jesus will return. Worship is an act of faith and of hope. And as we put our faith in God and our hope in God, we're able to love the world. And so this Christmas, worship the incarnate Son of God. And you don't have to see him as a babe in Methlehem's manger, but see him as a lamb in the throne of heaven. Know that he has conquered and that he will come again and set all things right, make all things new. Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. As you journey on into the weekend, Go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.